So in Zechariah, of course, Zechariah is uh, you know one of the more. There's a lot of, of course, always ne negativity, but Zechariah uh, is actually more of one of the positive messages uh, when you when you read the prop when you read the prophets. And the reason for that is, if you would keep something in Zechariah eight, but just go back to chapter one, you know, it's because of what's taking place in Israel's history at this time. And we have to remember that Zechariah is preaching to Israel when they're you know have begun to come into the land to rebuild. You know, at this point, the temple is being rebuilt or has been rebuilt, rather, and they're going back to kind of finish up the house of the Lord and build the walls and so on and so forth. Because it says there in Zechariah chapter 1, verse 1, In the eighth month of the second year of Darius came the word of the Lord. Uh, it says in verse 2, uh, The Lord hath been sore displeased with your father, so on and so forth. But th that time frame right there is the time when they've rebuilt the temple. They're, they're, they're beautifying the temple, and they're, this is a time of rebuilding for Israel. So Zechariah here, if you might have noticed it in that reading of chapter 8, there's a lot of positive you know, uh, notes there. He's saying to them to be glad and to be happy about what's taking place. And uh, the Lord wants to bless them. If you're there in Zechariah chapter 8, look at verse 13. It says, And it shall come to pass that as you were a curse among the heathen, O house of Israel, and O house of Judah and house of Israel, so will I save you, and you shall be a blessing. Fear not, but let your hands be strong. For thus saith the Lord of hosts, as I thought to punish you when your fathers provoked me to wrath, said the Lord, saith the Lord of hosts, and I repented not, so again have I thought in these days to do well unto Jerusalem and to the house of Judah, fear ye not. So you can see the Lord is trying to encourage them and telling them not to be afraid, but to be strong, that God is doing a work, that he wants to bless them. <laughs> and what that should show us is that, you know, God chastens us in order to bring us to the place of repentance and blessing. You know, and this is all just means of introduction, but... If you would, go over to keep something in Zechariah all morning, go over to Hebrews chapter 12. You see, the Lord in the past had chastened Israel, you know, and we know the story that they were taken out of land, they were taken captive into Babylon and lived there 70 years. That time has come to an end. But God did that so that he could bring them to a place of blessing and repentance and obedience. The Bible says in Proverbs chapter 3, you're going to Hebrews 12, it says, My son, despise not the chastening of the Lord, neither be weary of his correction. For whom the Lord loveth, he correcteth, even as a father, uh, the son in whom he delighteth. And of course, that's quoted again where you are in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 3. It says, For consider him, speaking of Jesus, that can endure such contradiction of sinners against himself, <clears throat> lest ye be wearied and faint in your minds. Ye have not resisted unto blood, striving against sin, and have forgotten the exhortation which speaketh unto you as unto children. My son, despise not thou the chastening of the Lord, nor faint when thou art rebuked of him. For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth, and scourgeth every son whom, re, whom he receiveth. So the Bible's saying here, look, every one of us as a child of God is going to receive chastening. And why is that? Because none of us is perfect. You know, no one gets saved and all of a sudden just becomes this perfect Christian overnight. We all have to grow. We all have to learn lessons along the way. And God chastens us. That's how he brings us uh, to this place where we, where we can grow and, and, to, and to learn and take on more. In fact, it says there in verse 7, If ye endure chastening, God deal with you as with sons. For what son is he whom the Father chasteneth not? He says in verse 8, But if ye be without chastisement, whereof all are partakers, then ye are, are ye bastards and not sons. So what he's saying here is, look, if, you're, if you can go on and continue living a wicked life and experience no chastening from, God's, uh, from God, you might want to you know, examine yourself to see whether you're even in the faith. You know, and that's if, and I'm sure any of us could look back and we could say, and over our Christian life, and, and could say, well, here's, you know, I messed up here, and God dealt with me here, and God was dealing with, with me here, and so on and so forth. So we see here this morning so far that God chastens and works in our lives to bring us to a place of blessing. And He wants us, what is, what is the point behind that? To get us right with God. You know, that's what He's doing here in Zechariah's day. You know, they're, He's getting them right with God, they've gotten right with God, and He wants to bless them. But getting right with God is just the beginning. You know, it's not like we get right with God, we start to clean up our lives and do the things that we ought to do and quit doing the things we shouldn't do. But that doesn't mean that once we start to do that, that that's it. That's all there is to the Christian life. And if you would, turn over to 2 Peter chapter 3. 2 Peter chapter 3. You see, God doesn't save us to just live an idle life. And I'm glad for that. I'm glad that the Christian life isn't just us you know, passing the time like everybody else until we, you know, take our dirt nap. That, you know, we have things to do that are of eternal importance. That we have things to do in this life that are going to make an impact in heaven forever. And look there in Second Peter chapter 3, verse 10. It says, But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, 
in the which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. The earth also and the works that are therein shall be burned up. Seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved, what manner of persons ye ought to be in all holiness, excuse me, in all holy conversation and godliness. So Peter is saying here, look, we know what's coming. And because of what's coming, we see what persons we ought to be. We know that one day everything's going to burn up. We know that the day of the Lord is coming and that we only have this life to live for the Lord, to earn those eternal rewards. That's why he says, he, he, you know, uh, seeing that all these things then shall be disavowed, dissolved, what manner of persons you ought to be and what manner of persons ought we to be in all holy conversation and godliness. You know, there's a way we ought to live our life as Christians because there's something for us to do, because there's work for us to do. And so the point being right out of, the, out of the gate here is that, you know, God doesn't want us to just live an idle Christian life where we just kind of pass the time. Yes, we're saved. Yes, we're on our way to heaven. You know, we got our ticket punched, but God doesn't just want, you know, Jesus to be this fire escape for us. That he actually wants us to serve him and to live for him and to accomplish things for him. If you're there in 2 Peter, go back to uh, chapter 1. And here's the thing, you know, you have to preach this because living an idle life, you know, is very possible. You know, it's real easy to do, especially today. And, you know, this, this culture that we're living in, the United States of America, you know, it's possible to do this. And in fact, it's common. And, you know, we have a lot of Christians. I mean, how many times we run into Christians out there, you know, knocking doors that don't go to church. And they're saved, but they're not going to church. They're not living for God. They might even be backslidden. They're definitely backslidden if they're not going to church, but they're backslidden. They're not serving the Lord. I mean, they're saved. They're on their way to heaven. But they're not doing anything for God. I would say that's the vast majority of people. In fact, that's a vast majority of Christians, rather, I should say. In fact, that's probably the vast majority of Christians that even go to a lot of churches. You know, a lot of people can go to church and punch in, you know, and, and, and do, you know, put in their, their dues at church. You know, show up, and, 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 and I'm glad for that, whether it's this church or another church or, you know, especially in the mega churches, you know, the neo-evangelical churches, you know, the, just the, the, you know, the fun centers that are out there, as we call them. You know, a lot of people show up there, and that's all they're going to do for God that week. They're just going to show up to church, sit down, listen to what the preacher has to say, you know, and leave. And that's it. And that's where their Christian life begins and ends. That's a very easy thing to fall into, you know, we, and we have to guard against that. It's very easy for us to just want to take it easy, kick back, you know, because quite frankly, there's a lot to do in the world. I mean, there's a lot of different things that aren't even necessarily sinful and that, that in, in certain, you know, in moderation are perfectly acceptable. You know, a lot of different hobbies and things that we can get involved in. And those things are fine and good, but when they start to replace, you know, serving God, that's when we have to step back and kind of say, what's going on here? But look there in 2 Peter uh, chapter 1, verse 8. He says, For if these things be in you and abound, they make you that you shall be neither unfruitful, or excuse me, neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. So what we see is that, you know, there's certain things that if we do them and if we abound in them, if we make those things that we are supposed to do as Christians uh, the, the, uh, the, the primary things that we do in life, if that's where, if we emphasize those things, that Peter lists here, and we'll look at it in a minute, that we are not going to be barren in our Christian life, that we're going to be fruitful. We're not going to be unfruitful, but fruitful, that we're going to bear fruit in our Christian life. And that's what God wants for all of us. That's what God wants for every single Christian, not to just move through life barren and unfruitful. And what do we mean? You know, when we think about barren, we're probably, most people's minds go to thinking about, you know, the inability to have children, Okay. Now, spiritually speaking, you know, that Christians can do that. They can go through their whole life with no spiritual children. Of course, what do, we, what do I mean by that? Well, the Bible says that the, 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 uh, the fruit of righteousness is a tree of life. You know, the fruit of righteousness, you know, a tree bears fruit, and what does it bring forth with that fruit? Another tree. So the fruit of righteousness in our life is another tree, right? So that would be us, you know, bringing forth spiritual children, going out, preaching the gospel, and seeing people being born again, you know, begetting them again in the gospel. So that, you know, if, if we do these things, we will have a fruitful, and Christ, you know, a fruitful life, a, not, a life that is not barren. And, you know, soul winning is just one area. You know, we need to learn how to become fruitful in many other areas, you know, when it comes to our spirit and so on and so forth. And if you look there in 1 Peter chapter 1, you know, he says, if these things be in you in verse 8, 
And what is he talking about? Well, he's talking about the preceding verses. And when we look through verses 5 through 7, what do we see there? We see a Christian's to-do list. And that's the title of the sermon tonight, or this morning. The Christian's to-do list. You know, I, I'm a big fan of to-do lists. It helps me keep a lot of things in order. If I don't write it down, it's not going to get done. If I don't put it on a list somewhere, because I just have so many small details coming at me throughout the week, a lot of different things you have to keep track of, and probably everybody experiences this, this to some degree. You know, I'm sure there's some men in here that probably have a list at home that somebody else wrote for them, right? That they, that, that's stuck there on the board or wherever, and it says honeydew or to-do, right? So we all know what a to-do list is, but here's the thing. God gives us a to-do list in the Bible. In fact, he gives us several. You know, we, it would take a long time to sit here and go through all of them. But we see here in 2 Peter 1, he says in verse 5, And besides this, give all diligence, add to your faith virtue, and to virtue knowledge, and to knowledge temperance, and to temperance patience, and to patience godliness, and godliness brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness charity. These are things that we are to be adding to our faith. And that takes, of course, effort. That takes you know, purpose, that's something that we have to purpose to do in our life. So that's a Christian's to-do list. <clears throat> now, let me just clarify, and if you would, uh, turn over to, uh, well, just stay where you're at, just stay where you're at. But let me clarify before I say, go any further in the sermon, is that this is the Christian's to-do list, okay? You know, we understand that we as Christians, you know, we're, we're saved by grace through faith. Isn't that what it says in Ephesians chapter 2? For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. We all know that. We all quote that at the door if we go out soul winning. We understand what that means, that salvation is all by grace, that we don't have to do any work at all. You know, that if you looked at 1 Peter chapter 1 and just scratched, you know, well, don't literally scratch it out, but just didn't take heed, let's say, to verses 5 through 7, you know, you could still go to heaven. If you decided not to give diligence to add to your faith all these things, You'd still go to heaven because what? You have the faith. Remember, if you look there, you know, you're adding to the faith. The faith is the basis of, of, of your Christian life, of course. So again, you know, we understand that uh, you know, this is the Christian's to-do list. These are the works that we have to do after we get saved. As it says in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9, which we're very familiar with, that it's not of works, lest any man should boast. But verse 10 is the one we kind of sometimes forget about. It goes on and says, For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works. You know, the reason why God saved us, you know, to save us from hell, God didn't just save us to just go through life doing whatever we please. You know, he saved us unto good works, which God bef hath before ordained that we should walk in them. So there are works that God wants us to do as Christians. And what we're going to look at this morning is not an inclusive list. You know, th they would take... Uh, you know, a long time to go through God's entire to-do list, which is why it's so important to be in church, to hear the preaching of the Word of God, to, uh, you know, get your, the Bible yourself and read it, because this is just what, really, this is just one long to-do list. It's also a not-to-do list, you know, not, not, you know, not just the things we should do, but it also tells us all the things we shouldn't be doing. So it would be a very long sermon indeed to try to go over all that. So this is not an inclusive list this morning. <clears throat> but if you're there in First Peter, excuse me, Second Peter, uh, you know, look there in verse uh, verse nine. You know, it says, "But he that lacketh these things is blind, and cannot see afar off, and hath forgotten that he was a purge from his old sins." So he's saying, "Look, the person who has the faith and does not add to it, does not add the works of the of the Christian life to it, they cannot see afar off." You know, they don't see the fact that the day of the Lord will come as a thief in which the, the, the heavens shall pass away and the earth and the works therein shall melt with fervent heat. They're not thinking about that. They're not motivated to work for the Lord. They cannot see what? Afar off. They can't see what's coming, what's down the road. And they fail to accomplish this list. Why? Because they're short-sighted. They just think about the fact, well, I'm just saved. You know, I can just, you know, just coast through life now. I know I'm on my way to heaven but they're, they're not getting anything done. Why? Because they're just seeing today. They're just seeing what's in front of them right now. They're not thinking about the world to come, life everlasting, our heavenly reward. And here's the thing, you know, there's a due date on this to-do list that God gives us. Remember when you had, we're given homework assignments, the, the teacher doesn't say, just turn it in whenever you feel like. You know, you're in 10th grade, you're turning your third grade homework. That ain't, that's not how it works. You know, they say, this is due tomorrow. This is due next week. There's a test coming up. You have to do this, this, and this. There's due dates, right? You go to your job. They say, 
we want this done by this time on this date. You know, there's, there's deadlines. And there's a deadline on the Christian life. You know, we only have this life to accomplish what we're going to accomplish for Christ. Jesus said in Revelation 22, And behold, I come quickly, and my reward is with me to give every man according to, uh, a, a, as his work shall be. So we will be uh, uh, rewarded for our works accordingly, whether we did works or whether we didn't do the works. So he gives this due list, uh, this due date on this list, okay? Now, <laughs> the Lord gave, we're going to look at a different to-do list, which was back in Zechariah. You're saying, why did you turn to Zechariah this morning? What does that have to do with anything? Well, if you go back to Zechariah chapter 8, we'll see another one of these Christians to-do list in Zechariah chapter 8. <coughs> he said in verse 8, or chapter 8, verse 16, these are the things that ye shall do. I mean, buckle up. <laughs> he's about to lay out, you know, give you some commandments here, right? And this is what he's telling them. Look, I'm, I've, I've chastened you. You're, you guys have repented. I'm bringing you back into the promised land. You're going to be strong. I want you to rejoice. It's going to be a feasting. People are going to be glad. It's a time of happiness. But here's the things I want you to do. Okay? And, and you know, the Christian life can be a joyful life, can be an exciting life, but there's things that we have to do along the way. He says in, in uh, verse 16, These are the things that you shall do. Speak ye every man truth to his neighbor. Execute the judgment of truth and peace in your gates. And let none of, your, uh, none of you imagine evil in your hearts against his neighbor. And love no false oath. For all these are things that I hate, saith the Lord. So he gives us this list. And again, this is just one small section in one book of a, of a long to-do list, which is the Bible. But let's look at some of these things tonight, or this morning, that we could learn from. We could take note of this list. You know, we saw the list in 2 Peter but here's another list that you know we could we could apply to our lives. He says in uh, <clears throat> second or excuse me Zech Zechariah chapter eight verse sixteen, speak ye true every man truth to his neighbor. You know I, I was thinking about that. Well, what how can we apply that today? You know we could apply this in several different ways. You know we could talk about you know uh, me, as a preacher I immediately go to like well let me make sure what I'm saying is true. Make sure when I get up in the pulpit that I'm preaching this book and not just my opinion or how I feel about something. Not teaching for you know, uh, f uh, not teaching traditions of men for the for the commandments of God, you know. Speak truth to every you know, every man his neighbor. But you know, we could all apply this in the area of soul winning. And you say, well, I can't apply that. Well, maybe it's time to start soul winning. Then you this will apply. Okay, he says, speak ye truth every man to his neighbor. And what is the gospel? The gospel is the word of truth. If you would turn over to uh, turn over to, uh, I should have had to go to Ephesians, but go to Colossians chapter one. Uh, Colossians chapter 1. You know, if we're going to speak the truth every man to his neighbor, you know, we could speak the word of truth, which is the gospel. The Bible says in Ephesians 1, in whom also ye trusted after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation. James chapter 1, verse 18. Of course, uh, of his own will begat he us with the word of truth. You know, we were saved, we were born again by the word of truth, the gospel. You're there in Colossians chapter 1, look at verse 5. For the, uh, the hope which is laid up for you in heaven, whereof ye heard before in the word of truth, the gospel. So if we're going to go out and speak the truth every man to his neighbor, what are we going to speak? We're going to speak the gospel. We're going to preach the gospel. And that's something we should all be doing. You know, that's one of the fundamentals of the Christian faith. One of the fundamentals of the Christian life, rather, is to go out and to preach the gospel to every creature. And that's what Jesus said. That was his last commandments when he left this earth. He said, and he said unto them, Go ye into all the world, and preach the gospel to every creature. Speak the truth every man to his neighbor. <clears throat> now, if you would, go over to 2 Corinthians chapter 4. 2 Corinthians chapter 4. You know, preaching the gospel is a command that we must obey. You know, we, if we can say, well, preaching the gospel, you know, it's just not for me. No, it's for everybody. It's for every man, woman, boy, girl, child. It's for everybody. You know, and, and everybody has to start somewhere. I understand that, but... It's a command in the Christian life. It's on everybody's Christian to-do list to preach the gospel. And he says in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 1, Therefore, seeing we have this ministry, as we have received mercy, we faint not. But we have renounced the hidden things of honest, dishonesty, not walking in craftiness, nor handling the word of God deceitfully, but by manifestation of the truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. But if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost in whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, 
who is the image of God, should shine unto them. For we preach not ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord, and ourselves are your servants for Jesus' sake. Look, if we don't preach it, people are going to die and go to hell. You say, why does God command us to go out and preach the gospel? Why does God want us to speak truth every man to his neighbor? Because if what, without it, you know, their, their minds are blinded, and they're going to remain blinded. That the, They need someone to take the glorious light of the gospel and shine it unto them. <clears throat> we need to do that. And here's the thing, if you don't make it a must in your, in your life, you won't get it done. You know, one, one thing I like to do is I, I use, uh, I try different ways to be, you know, you know, get into this whole, you know, pro productivity culture that's out there. You know, people have all these different ways of, you know, tracking your to-dos and, and your tasks and everything like that. You know, and, I, and I've tried different things. And the best thing for me is just, you know, use my phone. You know, like Google Tasks. This was brought to you in part by Google, Google Tasks, okay? That's one thing that really works for me. I've tried different things. And one thing I love about it is that, you know, you can hold down, the, like you say you have a list of all your, you know, your bullets of to-do things. If something's important, you could press it down, you could hold it and it floats and you can bring it to the top of the list and let it go. And you can organize your to-do list, right? You know, we've got a lot of things that are important in the Christian life. And I'm telling you, soul winning, you know, it needs to, you need to press that down on your to-do list and float that sucker up. You know, we've got, I know, well, I'm going to get to soul winning, I'm going to get to it. I've just got all these other things I got to get done. No, you need to move that up. You need to make that your highlight in your, of, of, your, of your week. What's the one thing I'm going to get done this week? I'm going to start soul winning. I'm going to go soul winning. It's important. It's a big part of the Christian life. Um, you know, it's something we need. There's a lot of other things that are essential, right? We could talk about Bible reading and prayer and church attendance and fellowship and, you know, raising our families and so on and so forth. Those are all very important. But I'm telling you right now, soul winning is a big theme in the New Testament. It's a big theme in this church. You know, and it's going to stay a big theme in this church. You know, you seem like, and you're like, Brother Corbin, it seems like every other sermon you're bringing it up, you're preaching about it. It's because it's important. You know, we got to stay motivated. We got to, you know, especially when we get into these hot months where everyone's kind of like, well, oh, you know, we, I'll wait till it cools off a little bit and get out there. And I know it's hard and I know it's difficult and it, it can be a weariness to the flesh, but, you know, it's not easy. But here's the thing it's rewarding, it's incredibly rewarding. You know, I can't, I, I talk, was talking about this to somebody the other day. I thought, I said, you know how many times I just drug my carcass out to go slow winning when I didn't want to go? You know, or just my flesh is just like, man, you can just take it easy. And here's the thing. I understand that there's, there's seasons in life where we have, there's something that we just, uh, something else we have to attend to that we have to take care of. I get that. I'm, I'm, I understand that. But here's the thing. If that, if that season of our life defines our whole life, that's no longer a season. That's just your life, you know, and that you need to change that, Okay. But how many times where I didn't have a, a reasonable, you know, excuse to not go soul winning? You know, when I was just saying, well, I don't really want to go. I just don't feel like it. It wasn't that something else demanded my attention. There was something else I had to take care of, you know, or I had to give something or somebody else priority. It was just I didn't feel like it. And how many times I just said, well, I know I don't feel like it, but I'm going to go anyway. And I get out there and I knock that first door, I knock that second door, and I talk to somebody or see my partner give the gospel. And as soon as that happens, it just, it's like all, and I'm just saying to myself, this is all I want to do. What was wrong with me? Why didn't I want to go out here? And my spirit is revived. You know, my flesh, you know, it's still hot. You know, it's still, I'm still getting a sunburn. I'm still sweating. I'm still thirsty. Nothing's changed there. But my spirit has, you know, been rekindled. And my, my you know, I, I just want to be out there doing the work of the Lord. It's rewarding. It's rewarding right now. You know, a, a part of the reason we do it is because we know there's a reward that comes, you know, when Jesus comes to re give every man according to his works. We understand that, but, you know, it's also rewarding now. It'll be, re it'll be refreshing to your spirit when you go out and actually see somebody get saved. It's an amazing thing. And here's the thing. You need to put it on that list and put it up there and just determine to do it because your flesh will fight you every step of the way. Look, the old man is still with us, folks. He doesn't want to do anything in the, in, the, in the spiritual. He doesn't want to, he's just, you know, there's two natures in us now, you know, and whether we walk in the spirit or walk in the flesh, that's up to us, you know, and if, and if we walk in the spirit, you know, we're going to do the things that God wants us to do. And if we walk in the flesh, then we're not going to do the things that God wants us to do. And the flesh is going to fight. He's going to say, you know, stay home. Don't, don't worry about soul winning. Go take a nap. You know, you don't need to go to church today. You don't need to go to church tonight. You don't need a midweek service. You, know, you, don't, you don't need to read your Bible. You don't have time to pray. All these things that are, should be priorities on our list, and the flesh is going to fight us. 
So that was one of the first things we saw on that list in Zechariah chapter 8. He said, speak ye truth to every man to his neighbor. You know, and every one of these things could be a whole sermon in and of itself, and I'm trying not to let you know, just any one of them become a sermon to uh, what, you know, the, the whole sermon this morning. So we're going to move on to the next one. He said in verse 16, uh, speak, ye truth every man, speak ye every man truth to his neighbor, execute judgment of truth and peace in your gates. Execute the judgment of truth and peace in your gates. And if you would, turn over to Acts chapter 20. Acts chapter 20. <clears throat> you know, he's saying, uh, you know, preach the Bible, I think is what he's saying here. You know, live it, preach it, you know, execute it. You know, when we think about, you know, what do you think about when you, when you hear that word execute? You might think of like, we well, might think of like a guy in a black hat cutting people's heads off or something. I don't know. But I think also the word, you know, executive, right? Execute, executive. So, you know, like the president of the United States, he's, you know, the executive branch. He's, what is he doing? He's the one who's making things happen. You know, he's the one that executes the law. The judge is an, you know, an executor of the law. You know, we should execute, uh, you know, the judgment of truth and peace in our gates. You know, in our gates where we dwell, where we live, where we spend our time, those should be places where we exercise truth and peace. <clears throat> he says in Acts chapter 20, verse 26, Wherefore I take you to record this day, of course, this is Paul giving his departing words to uh, the people at Ephesus, the elders at Ephesus. He says, I take you to record this day that I am pure from the blood of all men, for I have not shunned to declare unto you the counsel of, uh, all the counsel of God. How much of the counsel of God did he declare unto him? All of it. He executed all of it. All of the judgment. The, the good, you know, all the, all the parts that everyone just, you know, scratches everyone's back and makes everyone feel warm and fuzzy inside, but also all the, you know, the nitty-gritty parts of the Word of God. The parts that maybe we go, whoa, make a step back parts that the world objects over. He declared all the counsel of God. Look there, down at verse 31. And he did this to all men. Okay? Therefore, watch and remember that by the space of three years, I cease not to warn everyone night and day with tears. So why was Paul free from the blood of all men? Because he warned them. And he warned all of them. Because he declared the whole counsel of God. You know, he didn't just declare some of it. You know, he was free from the blood of all men because he cleared all of it. If you would, go over to 2 Timothy chapter 3. 2 Timothy chapter 3. You know, we need to preach and teach and live the Bible. All of it. Not just the parts that people agree with. Not just the parts that people are, are not going to give us a hard time over. All of it. We need to preach and teach it in, in its entirety. We need to execute judgment and truth in our gates. He said in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16, all scripture is given by inspiration of God. You know, you turn it back to some obscure passage in the Old Testament that rubs the fur the wrong way, you know, upsets people. And they say, oh, I don't know about that. Well, I'm, I'm sure God, God's changed. Or you shouldn't preach that. You should, you know, you should talk about that. But what does it say right there? All scripture, New Testament, Old Testament. You know, Leviticus, Deuteronomy, all those parts that, that preachers just want to flip over and pretend aren't there. They, God says those are profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. That the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. You know, he gives all of it for what reason? That, we, that the man of God may be perfect. You know, a preacher who's not preaching the whole counsel of God, he's not perfect. He's not complete. That's what it means, perfect. You know, he's not perfect and entire, wanting nothing, as it says in James. You know, he's, he's not thoroughly furnished into all good works. You know, he's missing a big, like if you had a, you know, if you're in you know, a certain line of work, sometimes you have to have specialized tools. And if you don't have a particular tool, you're not going to get that job done. Well, you know, preaching is a specialized job. I mean, it's something that not just everybody does. And this is a, this is a specialized tool right here. And if I just go, well, I don't need this section and just tear out a whole section or a page or a passage, you know, I've, I've just taken one of my tools that I need to get the job done and just thrown it in the garbage. And that's the way a lot of preachers, you know, today operate, unfortunately. They don't preach the entire counsel of God. And that's what we need to do. And that's part of our Christian to-do list, you know, is to execute judgment or to execute the judgment of truth and peace in our gates. You know, preach it, preach all of it and live it, you know, show, you know, as preachers, as husbands, wives, parents, you know, we need to show as neighbors, employees, every area of life, you know, we should be showing forth uh, the, you know, the, the, the truth of God's word. 
<clears throat> so preach the unpopular parts and preach the popular parts of the Bible. Why? Because that judgment, that's what leads to peace. That's what leads to peace. Everyone wants peace, right? It's all right here. You know, the world wants peace, but they don't want to do what it takes to get it. You know, and wanting world peace isn't a bad thing. It's just how they go about getting it, right? And not understanding that it's not, there is going to be no peace apart from Jesus. Until he comes and reigns with a rod of iron, there will be no peace. But, you know, we can have peace personally in our individual lives as a church, as families, and so on and so forth, when we embrace all of the word of God, when we execute judgment and truth in our gates. The Bible says in Psalms 119, Great peace have they which love thy law, you know, and nothing shall offend them. Nothing. You know, if we love, all of the, love his law, if we love all of it, we're going to have great peace. Say, I want peace. Do you love the Bible? I don't have peace. Do you love the Bible? <clears throat> Let's move on, though. He says in verse 17, Let none of you imagine evil in your hearts against his neighbor. Go to Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4. We'll just touch on this one real quick. Because this is an important one. You know, we've got to have all... This is a, one of the many Christian to-do lists that we find in the Bible. He says, let none of you imagine evil in your hearts against his neighbor. You know, earlier already he said, speak the truth every man to his neighbor. So you should speak the truth to every man, but not only that, you should not imagine evil. You're going to Ephesians 4, it says in Proverbs 3, devise not evil against thy neighbor, seeing he dwelleth securely by thee. Strive not with a man, strive with, uh, not with a man without a cause, if he have done thee no harm. And then we shouldn't go out of our way to, you know, do mischief unto our neighbor. Look there, Ephesians chapter 4, verse 25. Wherefore, putting away lying, speak every man truth with his neighbor, for we are members one of another. I mean, sometimes the truth hurts, we understand that, but let's make sure what we're speaking is the truth and not to imagine, you know, evil in our hearts. You know, in unity in, unity in the local church, you know, that's something that doesn't just happen. It's something that has to be worked for because, look, we're all coming from different walks of life, different periods in life, different stages in life. We all have different backgrounds, different personalities. Not every, I don't think we're all just going to, you know, everyone's going to get together and just be one big happy family all the time. You know, even within a family, you know, kids are fighting, kids get out of sorts with one another, parents get frustrated with each other, and so on and so forth. And you got to work through those things. And to what end? To maintain the unity. It's something that has to be worked for. That's something that has to be maintained. And how do you do that? By not imagining evil in your heart towards your brother. So let's, or towards your neighbor. And he says, uh, let's move on though. Let's go to the next one. He says in verse uh, 17, he said, And let none of you imagine evil in your hearts against his brother. And he said, And love no false oath. You know, love no false oath. And what's he saying here? Don't tolerate lies. You know, don't love a false oath. Don't love lies. Go over to Jeremiah uh, chapter 7. Jeremiah chapter 7. <clears throat> Here's the thing. You think about the fact that a lot of lies are committed. A lot of, there's a lot of falsehood in, the, in religion, isn't there? I mean, there's a lot of falsehood out there. And, and if we're not careful, you know, we'll, we'll learn to tolerate a lot of it. You know, that's, what, that's, what the, that's the big, uh, that's the, uh, that's the kind of the hot word that's out there, right? Tolerance. You know, unity at all costs. No, it's not right. Not to love a false oath. Don't love lies. Okay? You should hate lies. Look, lies are what damn people to hell. You know, if you believe a lie, you know, you, you, and love not the truth, you know, that, that damns people. Look in Jeremiah chapter 7. It says in verse 8, Behold, ye trust in lying words that cannot profit, Will ye steal, murder, and commit adultery, and swear falsely, and burn incense unto Baal? So we're talking in a, in a religious context, right? You know, they're burning incense unto Baal, and walk after other gods which ye know not. They're swearing falsely. You know, there's a lot of lies in religion today. <clears throat> and he says, and in verse 10, And come and stand before me in this house, which is called by my name, and say, We are delivered to do all these abominations. Saying, look, you know, you can't, you cannot drink at the cup of, the, you can't, uh, what's the verse? You can't drink at the cup of devils and, at, and, and sup at the table of the Lord. You can't have it both ways. You cannot serve God and mammon. You can't serve God and lies. You have to pick one. 
You know, that's what he's saying here. Look, you, you swear falsely, you do all this wickedness, you burn incense unto Baal, you walk after other gods and, and whom you know not, and come and stand before me in this house, which is called by my name, and say, we are delivered to do all these abominations. You say, what's wrong with it? You know, what this sounds like is ecumenicalism to me. It sounds like, hey, what's wrong with, you know, this church and that other church and this religion and that other religion? What's wrong with, you know, Buddhism? What's wrong with, uh, you know, Roman Catholicism? What's wrong with, you know, all these other false ways? It's because they're preaching lies. Look, if someone is telling you you have to work your way to heaven, that's a lie. If it doesn't line up with this book, it's a lie. And we have to determine what are we going to love more? The Lord and His Word and the truth, or are we going to love a false oath? Are we going to love lies? Are we going to go ahead and say, well, what's wrong with it? You know, we come into, come into God's house and say, well, there's nothing wrong with, you know, there's nothing wrong with the Muslim and the Hindu. Look, there's nothing wrong with them as people. I'm sure there's fine, good people in all of those religions, but they're damned to hell if they believe a lie. And we want to deliver them. And that's a big reason why we can't just tolerate it, you know, and just tell them, oh, you're okay, because they're not okay. They need to come to a repentance and the acknowledging of the truth. That Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. And that salvation is by grace through faith. Say, what's the difference between what your church believes and every, everything else in the world? And, I, and you know what? I don't say this haughtily, but it's the truth. And it's profound. Is that this church, and like many other churches, and any church that actually preaches the whole counsel of God, believes that salvation is by grace through faith and not of works. Every other false way will teach you it's by works. That's the difference. Whether it's the Hindus, whether it's the Muslims, whether, you know, even in the realm of Christianity, the Mormons, the Catholics, the Episcopalians, all of them, you name it, they all teach you you got to be a good person. You got to get baptized, you got to get catechized, and homogenized, and pasteurized, and all these other eyes. You got to do all these steps, you got to go through this process and keep the commandments and live a good life. Look, we hear it all the time. You say, well, that doesn't sound right. Well, maybe if you, we did more soul winning, we'd actually go talk to people who were caught up in these false religions, we'd understand this. We hear it all the time out there. Yep. What do you got to do to go to heaven? Be a good person. Keep the commandments. I hear it all the time. Right. Why do you hear it all the time? Because that's what they're being taught. Who's teaching them? All these false ways. You know, all these, these people that want to teach them lies. I mean, that's what the devil does. He wants to go out and just sow lies, get people to just believe a lie that they might be damned. So don't tolerate these things. He's saying, love no false oath. You don't love it. Don't say, oh, it's okay. I can put up with it. No, it's wicked. It's, it's leading people to hell. Don't tolerate it. False ways need to be called out and condemned. You know, by the, by the preacher, of course. You know, it's the job of the man of God to get up and say, this way is false. This way is false. And look, it's because this book is true. You know, this is our authority. You know, we're... We, I say that not because it says Baptist on the door. I say that because that's what this book teaches. That, you know, this is the, the, this is the truth. You know, this is our final authority. You know, who are you to call every other, fault, every other religion false? I'm nobody. But this, that's what this book says if we read it and if we're honest with it. <laughs> you know, so of course that's the preacher's job to get to do that. But, you know, it's also our job in our personal life to not love lies, not to love a false oath. And to call it out for what it is. And to, you know, obviously you have to use tact, you have to be gentle, and all that thing, that in, in, in the, speak the truth in love, as Paul said. But we still need to speak the truth. We, we say, well, it's loving for me to just not say anything. No, that's not, that's not love. You need to speak the truth in love. That's the loving thing to do. And why is it, you know, why do we need to take note of this, this list this morning? Why would I even turn us over to this obscure passage in Zechariah and have us read these couple verses and try to you know, Im impress upon us the need to do all these things today because of the fact that you know, God hates these things when they go undone or if we do them. That's how he concludes this list. If you look there, <laughs> he says at the end of verse 17, he said, let none of you imagine even your hearts against this labor. Love no false oath or all these are things that I hate, saith the Lord. Say, why is this list important? Why are you even preaching this, Brother Corbin? Because God hates these things. God hates when they go undone. God hates when they're tolerated. God hates when we, do, when we do or don't do these things that he's telling us to do. You know, when you don't speak every man truth to his neighbor, when we just speak lies, when we devise evil against our neighbor, when we you know, don't execute judgment and truth, when we don't do those things, when we, 
when we love a false oath or tolerate it or put up with it, God hates that. And that, that fact right there is, a, is you know, shocking to some people. But go over to Proverbs chapter 6. It's not very often you walk into a church house and hear somebody get up and say, hey, God hates that. You know, hate is like a four-letter, well, it, it is a four-letter word, but, you know, it's like a four-letter word today. I was thinking about this. I remember it was probably like, I don't know. I mean, it was before I even got married, so it was probably like 12, 13 years ago where I was talking to somebody. And I was talking about something worldly, you know. I was just talking about some worldly thing, and I said, oh, I hate that. And this person said, oh, hate is such a strong word. And I, and I was just like, that was the first time I'd ever heard anything like that. You know, like where people would actually, you know, disparage you for using a word like hate in any context. You know, like you spit out a, a sandwich and say, I hate that sandwich. Oh, how dare you hate that sandwich? <laughs> you know, or you hate some worldly thing, you know, you, whatever it is. And someone would just like mildly rebu re, you know, re rebuked me for using the word hate. And I remember just, I didn't know what to say. I was like, well, that's, yeah, so I, I hate it. <laughs> You know, and today, and since then, it's just, it seems like it's gotten worse and worse and worse. And that, I'm, I've never forgot that because then I realized now, looking back on that moment, like, that's a whole philosophy and a whole teaching that this society is just putting on people. Don't hate anything. Don't hate anyone. If you hate, if you even say the word hate in the wrong way, you're wicked, you're wrong. But the Bible says God hates. I mean, isn't that what we just read over there in Zechariah chapter 8? For all these things, I hate, saith the Lord. Oh, Lord, hate such a strong word. Do you really want to use that? I have a strong disliking. <laughs> for all these things, the Lord doth not care for. No, he said, I hate. I hate these things. You say, hate's a strong word. Yeah. So when God uses it, we should probably pay attention. <clears throat> it doesn't mean don't use it. It means, you know, give it the, the emphasis, you know, it needs. And pay attention when it's used. He says in Proverbs chapter 6, are you there? Verse 16, these six things that the Lord hate. Say, oh, God doesn't hate anything. Well, I got a list of six things right here that God hates. Yep, he said, yea, seven are abomination. So abomination is, that's like, that's another whole level of hate. There's hating something and there's like, that's an abomination to me. Yep. You know, that's just infuriating. I detest it. You know, it's a very strong hatred when you say it's an abomination. Seven things are abomination. And we, we got the list here, a proud look, a lying tongue, hands that shed innocent blood. How dare God hate hands that shed innocent blood? I mean, what if God didn't hate hands that shed innocent blood? That'd be, that would be backwards. That would be wrong. You say, oh, I'm okay with that. That'd be wicked. Verse 18, in a heart that devises wicked imaginations. We kind of read about that a minute ago, did we? About imagining evil in our hearts, right? Uh, feet, uh, feet that be swift and running to mischief, a false witness that speaketh lies, you know, not speaking truth every man to his neighbor, loving a false oath. God hates it. <clears throat> a false witness that speaketh lies, and he that soweth discord among the brethren. You can see how this all ties in with Zechariah chapter 8, if you think about it. These are very similar, similar things that he's describing that God says he hates. Why should we pay attention to these lists? Well, when, it got, when he ends the list with, God hates these things when they're not done, when they are committed. We should definitely uh, take note. And again, you know, every one of these things that I just touched on this morning are entire sermons in and of themselves. And there are many other commandments, many other lists that we could look at that are ours to obey and to perform. And the point I'm just trying to get across this morning is not maybe these specific things, but the fact that if we fail to, if we leave these things undone, if we fail to, uh, to, to accomplish these things in our lives, if we just leave that to-do list, if we treat it like the one that's at home, men, you know, just undone on the board, right? Just, oh, I'll get to it later, I'll get to it later. You know, that, it's going to cause suffering, right? Even that list, you know, the honey-do list, if you leave it undone long enough, will cause suffering in another way, right? <laughs> but if we fail to accomplish the list that God gives us, the Christian to-do list that God has said, I want you to do this, 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 and this, and don't do this, and don't do this. And if we don't go through our life and start checking off these boxes, look, I'm telling you, it's going to lead to suffering in our lives. You know, it's going to lead to suffering in those around us. And we could just talk about that first one. We could just park it right there all morning and talk about that. 
The fact that if we don't go out and speak truth every man to his neighbor, people are going to suffer. People are going to die and go to hell. Say, it's not important for me to learn how to preach the gospel and go do it. You know, I can, I can not go soul winning. Look, there's somebody that you could reach out there that maybe one of us couldn't. You know, that's another person that we, there's a lot of people to get to. You know, I think about it all the time, with the, the goal that we're trying to accomplish here of knocking every door in Tucson in the greater area. You know, even, even accomplishing that, you know, that's a great goal and we're working towards that. But that needs to happen over and over and over for all the doors that, you know, they just weren't home that day. That was their chance, but they weren't home. You know, or, or the people that we have to pass up for one reason or another. Look, we got to get back over there again. That's why every single person, it matters whether or not you go soul winning. Because if you don't, and that's just, and again, I know I'm parking it on that. I'm kind of harping on it this morning, but that's just one thing. And if you don't do it, people are going to suffer. I mean, think about, you know, if, if we as parents don't fulfill our roles as moms and dads, our children will suffer. If we leave these things done, undone in our lives, people will suffer around us, those around us. And all of us, if we don't do these things, we will suffer the eternal loss of rewards. You say, you know, if I don't do these things, if I don't accomplish these to-do lists, it's no big deal. You know, but, it, well, you know, I'm still going my, on my way to heaven. But you're going to suffer eternal loss of rewards. You know, and it's really easy on this side to think, well, that would be so bad. You can't see it far off then. You cannot see it far off. It's not that real to you yet. To think about when you got, because the moment you get to heaven and God, you see the Lord just handing out rewards to so-and-so and rewards to so-and-so. People in your church that you knew that are getting crowned and being, you know, saying, hey, you be thou over five cities, be thou over ten, and it's your turn and you walk up and he's just like, I got nothing for you. I'm glad you're here. I'm glad you got saved, but, you know, you can just go stand in the corner now. Just go over there and, and, and sweep that floor. And people have this attitude, well, that's fine with me. It won't be. It won't be. When you look at what everybody else has, you're going you're gonna to wish you had done more. You're going to wish you had done more. You will suffer eternal loss of rewards. And you'll suffer for it. You know, personally and people in our lives. If we don't do these things, if we don't start to check off the Christian's to-do list. So each and, every, each and every one of us needs to look at these lists in the Bible. Lists like the one I just gave you this morning. You know, that one and others like it and just make it our life's work to start to accomplish these things. Let's go ahead and pray.